Good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Sebastian Schienle. I'm part of the Effective Spenden team in Germany. And it's my pleasure to now introduce the first presentation of the day and to welcome Johannes Aqua, Climate Lead at Founders Pledge to talk about effective climate philanthropy. Um, Founders Pledge is a global community of entrepreneurs that I'm sure many, most, maybe all of you are familiar with. Um, they work to find and fund the highest impact giving opportunities, including on climate change. And uh, the work on the topic has been featured in media like the New York Times and Vox. Uh, Johannes leads the climate work at Founders Pledge and has been passionate about the topic since his early uh, days as an environmental activist. Before joining Founders Pledge about one year ago, he spent five years working uh, at a think tank advising policymakers in Germany, the EU, and North America on climate policy. As climate, uh, excuse me, as Founders Pledge has been a leading voice on effective climate philanthropy since starting their work uh, on the topic about three years ago. I'm very pleased that we have an opportunity tonight to get an update from Johannes on their latest thinking and their recommendation. Um, as, a, as a quick reminder, we will have a brief Q&A at the, at the end of this presentation. So please put your questions in the chat. And with that, over to you, Johannes. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for the nice introduction. And yeah, I hope you, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, and I want to talk with you about high impact climate philanthropy and especially also the question of where should you give at this very moment. And if there's only like one thing you remember from this talk uh, about where to give effectively, I want this to be this one here. This like focus on supporting solutions that have a leverage on global emissions. And I'm going to talk about uh, the why and the how of that in the next couple of minutes, but that's kind of really the important message to remember in terms of effective climate philanthropy. And yeah, first kind of, we have to get a sense of what is actually uh, the challenge that we're facing and what does that, so like, what is actually, what does that actually mean? And this is kind of the challenge that we're facing. So this is energy growth um, over the last two centuries or so. And energy is about 80% or so of like long, long lasting emissions are related to energy. So it's kind of crucial, it's the centerpiece. But we can kind of see that, okay, over the last 200 years or so, energy growth has been really increasing and increasing rather massively, especially in the last 50 years. And at this point, essentially, energy growth is, is mostly just fossil growth, so emission growth, that, that means. And yeah, what we can see here is that, essentially, if we want to meet climate goals, uh, we need to get this number of this, like high carbon energy, essentially to zero by 2050, so over the next 30 years. And at the same time, we need to like support a world where energy demand is increasing. And that's mostly because people are escaping poverty. So we kind of need to plan for an energy system, for a global energy system that's at least twice the size, probably triple the size or much larger by the end of the century. So this is really like a vast challenge. And yeah, as I already stressed, what makes this challenge even harder, and especially harder, I guess, for us to solve most of us living in OECD countries is that most of the growth in energy demand is not going to be where we are. So roughly speaking, you can say like OECD countries maybe like have this, like as I'm showing my mouse, like about half or so of emissions right now, that share of energy, sorry, of energy, that share is going to remain roughly constant over, or that that absolute number is going to stay roughly constant over the uh, coming decades. So all of this big bulk of energy demand that's kind of needs to be affected and needs to go to zero carbon, almost all of that or very large share of that is kind of coming from regions that we're not kind of directly citizens of. So kind of the challenge of effective climate action when you're in an OECD country about effective climate giving is like how can we actually make that share lower carbon? And that challenge is again, like already is kind of vast, but it's like even vaster because well, um, the growth that is going to happen in uh, developing and emerging economies is kind of usually a lot more carbon intensive than kind of what we're used to. So like by default, uh, a lot of this energy is going to be quite carbon intensive. So that's really that's kind of the central climate challenge. And just to stress here one thing, like the fact that energy demand is growing is not a bad thing. It's kind of a very good thing. It means people are escaping poverty. And also, this does not mean that we, uh, citizens of OECD countries, do not have the major responsibility for climate change. We absolutely do. It just means that when we're trying to affect this issue, we kind of need to be aware of this reality. 
And of course, what does it mean being aware of this reality? I think the first reaction is to become quite fatalistic, to say like, what can I possibly do on this challenge? Not very much, right? Like I can maybe reduce my own emissions. I can do something in my community so that you can kind of do that. But in a way that's kind of a kind of fatalism that's kind of saying, okay, giving up on the challenge. But there's really another way and that's kind of like moving from realizing a challenge to taking like bold strategic action to be like really smart uh, about your actions. And in, in this case, particularly right now, we're going to talk about how you can be really smart about your climate philanthropy. And the principal strategy to be smart about your climate philanthropy, because overall, like in the big scheme of things, we're all small donors, is to use impact multipliers and to make sure that your dollars go much, much further in terms of solving the problem than they otherwise would if you would use them less smartly. And there are three multipliers that I'm going to talk about that I think together make for a really, really incredible impact proposition for climate philanthropy. One is audacious advocacy, I'm going to talk about next. The second is focusing that audacious advocacy on blind spots. And the third is doing so in a coordinated way. Um, so I'm going to talk about all of them together. They kind of constitute what we call the, the ABC of high impact climate philanthropy. Yeah, and the A for audacious advocacy is where I'll start. And I'll actually start with some, or actually not start, but until now this, this presentation is very much the typical climate is a big challenge presentation, but now I'm going to start with actually some good news. Namely that climate really is a, world, is a crisis that the world has evoked into. We can see this across Essentially, we can see this in, in Europe, we can see this in the US, we can also see that in China. Uh, so like it's really a challenge that people are becoming aware of to a much increased degree. And that means that this, like there's an amazing uh, opportunity for leverage and philanthropy. And uh, I can just show this here. This is from an analysis we just published today. So that's the reason that the um, graphic looks a little bit less developed than the rest. But so like this is kind of the like expected leverage, like how much does a uh, does donation of you kind of affect um, climate and, and like how this relates to different political environments. And what we can see here is like the C estimate for 2020 under Trump, and this is the estimate for 2021 um, under President-elect Joe Biden. And we estimate that kind of this, this shift has kind of increased like the expected effectiveness of your donations by a factor of 10. Why is that? Well, because the best advocates um, influence policy and kind of the policy window has like increased so significantly that kind of the opportunity, what we can actually do with philanthropy, the resources we can allocate better, etc. That's just a vast opportunity. And that's kind of the principal logic of audacious advocacy, using philanthropy to leverage, um, to have leverage on large societal resources and policy, etc. And yeah, in that spirit, we recommend currently as our top recommended charities, three charities. One of them is the Clean Air Task Force, which is laser focused on solutions across all kind of neglected technologies and approaches. The other one is Terra Praxis, which is focused on advanced nuclear, which could be a critical part of the decarbonization solution toolbox. And the third one is Carbon 180, which is focused on removing carbon from the air and they're very aptly named. Um, yeah, and just to kind of give you one example about like what we actually mean with this audacious advocacy that makes it a little bit more concrete going to focus on 45Q, which is a tax credit um, for carbon capture. Carbon capture is one of those technologies that the IPCC and everyone that kind of energy model is considered critical for decarbonization, but that's kind of lagging behind a lot in terms of where it is and where it should, from where it should go. And the Clean Air Task Force has led a campaign on kind of um, passing a tax credit to make this technology um, more feasible in the United States context. What would this actually do? Well, this could save a lot of carbon in the US, so this is an estimate for 2030 where this kind of saves 49 million tons of carbon every year going on from 2030, and that's really a great deal. Um, but ultimately, that's not what we're after. What we're really after here in terms of like funding strategic philanthropy is we're here for cost reductions. So if you read, this is kind of what I try to show here, uh, under a very modest learning rate, so if we like build all of the new carbon capture kind of incentivized by this tax credit. Uh, this is kind of where we would get to by 2030 or so the price of this technology would have. And that's kind of what we really want uh, given the global picture. And what we really want is we want to drive down the cost of technology or improve technology otherwise, and thereby enable global, global progress. And this is kind of what audacious advocacy is all about. Yeah, and sorry, I don't have any time to talk today about the assumptions. Um, 
But just to kind of put it in a nutshell, so you're starting with advocacy. Uh, you use this advocacy to enact policy change and like on very conservative assumptions about the impact of the Clean Air Task Force for enacting this policy. You get to something like from this advocacy, like to a price of uh, like like for a price of carbon saved by donations at like about one dollar uh, sixty. So this is kind of okay, that's nice. But really, then what we're going for is the innovation, the cost reductions, and then the next step that we're going for is kind of the global scaling, and that's kind of where you, where the multiplier comes in. So like we're using this, we're using policy to drive innovation, and then we're kind of ending up with an estimate, even under really extremely conservative assumptions of something like 10 cents per ton of carbon saved. That is the a value proposition uh, behind audacious advocacy. And yeah, this is how we can scale, yeah, get, get an impact, and this is how we can plausibly use philanthropy to make a difference like far beyond what we could normally get to. And yeah, now kind of what would we focus our audacious advocacy? That's kind of the second uh, multiplier here. And we should focus our advocacy on blind spots and technologies and approaches that are forgotten by the mainstream, even though they are critical. And yeah, that's kind of the basic, basic second multiplier. When making plants invisible, we can have an outsized impact. Why is that so? First, if we focus on blind spots, we can be sure that our efforts are additional. Uh, so that not someone else is just funding the very same thing and doing the very same thing. So it makes it much harder, uh, much easier to have counterfactual impact. The second is that usually early resources spent on a, on a field are especially impactful. One example for this is Carbon 180, um, another charity I'm going to talk about in a bit, which has like uh, championed uh, a National Academy of Science report on carbon removal and negative emissions that has kind of essentially shaped how the field is perceived in the, in the United States. So like these are some very early resources that have been quite impactful. And a third part of that is really the, cha the challenge of climate is to go to zero emissions. So if we don't focus on blind spots, if we only focus on what's easy, temperature stabilization is impossible. Together, what this gives us is a curve that looks something like this, where like this is effort, overall effort that we're spending, and this is overall impact. And we should very much focus on areas where there's relatively low effort, even though they're very important. But yeah, what are actually those areas? Well, a couple of those areas, and that here I'm going to talk about areas that the Clean Air Task Force is focusing on, uh, are like lots of hard to decarbonize sectors and industry, iron and steel, cement, load falling electricity, which means electricity that's not uh, intermittent renewables, but that we can follow the load. Long distance road transport, aviation, shipping. So these are kind of some of the challenges. And my basic rule, the way I talk about Clean Air Task Force is like, if it's neglected and important, you can be pretty sure that the Clean Air Task Force will have a program for it. So that's kind of the value proposition uh, for the Clean Air Task Force, apart from being like an incredibly strong organization, they're also kind of laser focused on uh, those solutions that are neglected to their potential. But they don't do everything. And there's this particular one technology bucket that we think is like incredibly neglected compared to its importance. And not only we think so, uh, but this is also, this is from a leading uh, innovation assessment that was just published a couple of months ago on priorities for the next administration in the US. The top priority where funding should increase the most compared to where it's now by over 200% is carbon dioxide removal. And that's exactly what carbon 180 is focused on. And what is this actually? Well, a carbon dioxide removal or negative emissions, as it's sometimes called, is essentially here everything that moves kind of when this is an emission trajectory over time, what moves stuff below uh, zero, which gets us to like what's called net zero. And this is really critical. All climate science, our energy decarbonization science agrees that this is critical, but has been incredibly neglected. So even like total philanthropic spending of this in the world is for something like 25 million a year. And even though this is kind of to like how to deliver a gigaton scale impact very soon. So like this is an area very neglected uh, that we focus on. And actually also the head of um, from, from head of carbon 180 has just joined the Biden administration and there's like, yeah, we're very hopeful that carbon 180 will be able to make a really positive uh, impact on the trajectory of that under, under the Biden administration. And then the third piece, uh, arguably the one I would usually have like to have more time to talk about, uh, is Terra Praxis, which is focused on advanced nuclear. And obviously it's always controversial to talk about nuclear, though advanced nuclear is, avoids a lot of the things that are controversial about existing nuclear. But really uh, the argument that Terra Praxis makes and in a very sophisticated way we think is that nuclear can be 
uh, a missing link uh, for a livable climate because it can help not only with decarbonizing electricity, also with like lots of other applications. And so they're an incredibly um, strong organization, we think as well. And also um, their advocate, Kirsty Gogan, I think is like um, one of the best advocates for nuclear in a way, and also like a very nuanced voice, not someone that's like advocating nuclear at the cost of other solutions, but rather talking about nuclear in the context of decarbonization, which is ultimately what we're interested in. So that's our praxis. So now I've talked about the blind spots. And yeah, the, now the last part of the C is actually uh, gonna be very brief here because we're almost out of time. The C for coordination and co-funding, because uh, yeah, like if we're kind of bringing our money together, it can be more impactful for lots of different reasons. We can do things like giving funding guarantees to charities, to top charities. We can react to timely opportunities, such as the changing situation in the US context. We can pool resources, which overall make things easier. And we can be more robust to uncertainty. We can like think about hedging, et cetera. And of course, it's much easier. And that is kind of why recently we have launched uh, the um, Climate Fund, uh, the Founders Dutch Climate Fund, which is our top recommendation uh, right now in climate because we're kind of um, pooling resources and doing all of these strategic things to kind of even increase the impact compared to uh, the charities that we um, recommend. Yes, just to summarize, there's the A uh, for audacious democracy, the B for blind spots and bottleneck, and the C for coordinated local funding. That is kind of the DNA we think of high impact climate philanthropy. It's a theory uh, behind our fund, and it's also kind of the criterion by which we like choose our charities and where I think our charities excel and prevent, uh, present a, like a great value proposition on climate. Yes. Thanks very much. That's the end of my talk. Uh, you can find us and donate to the fund at the Effective, at the effective Altruism Fund. And now I'm very happy uh, to yeah, answer questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Uh, thanks for walking us through your update and the, the policy recommendations. <clears throat> uh, what, one question uh, in, in that regard, you're focusing on advocacy and, and policy change. How does that compare in your view, to um, more direct uh, offsets or uh, lifestyle changes also in terms of effective um, actions each of us can take? Yes. Um, well, if you think about offsets, so like a good offset that you can actually believe actually reduces emissions will cost at least 10, more likely $20 per ton of carbon saved. The numbers that I just showed you for, for like the Clean Air Task Force is something like 10 cents under very conservative uh, assumptions. So, of course, you can give to offsets, um, but like it's very, um, very hard to think that it is anywhere near the most effective thing uh, that you can do. I think it's very clear, and like you know, like and if you feel like that, the goal is not to give less, right? But rather, like give the same amount that you would give to offsets, but give this to high impact uh, charity. As for lifestyle changes, you can do lifestyle changes, but the potential of that is ultimately very limited. So, like you can probably have 10 times or more impact through your giving. You don't have to be a rich person for that to be true. Uh, then you can like do through lifestyle changes, right? So like if you think, okay, donation to clean air task force, let's say be very conservative and say like, it costs like one $1 uh, to avoid a ton of carbon. So like essentially, and you usually you a person emits something like 11 tons per year. So you could, okay, let's even say it costs 10 euro, like you could, you could offset your emissions with like $100. And obviously you wouldn't have to stop there. My lifestyle changes get very painful uh, once you make some changes, right? So like it's, you can do all of those things, but this shouldn't make you lose sight of what's kind of the most effective thing that you can do. Great, thanks. And, and building on that, um, what would you say is kind of the, the, the comparison of the effectiveness between activism versus philanthropy for making an impact on climate change? Is there anything that can be done through activism directly? Absolutely, but I think I think I think of philanthropy as a form of activism. So both of those are forms of political action. Both of those have multipliers. Both of those are much better than focusing on your lifestyle. But I mean, for example, right now, like we have a special opportunity in the United States. Not all of us can move to the United States. Some of us are already there, but not everyone can move there and use activism. To It looks like we're using you, losing you, Johannes. Kind of improve the situation there, but we can all like achieve. What was the last thing that you heard? And so like the, the big advantage of philanthropy, the big advantage of philanthropy compared to activism, sorry. 
Go ahead, go uh, ahead. The big advantage of philanthropy, the big advantage of philanthropy compared to activism is that your money can be deployed wherever it has the highest impact, whereas your activism is quite locally constrained usually. Uh, we cannot all move to the US to improve US climate policy, but we can all give to the very best climate charities in the US to improve the outcome, and that has huge leverage. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do activism, you should do both, right? They're both kind of, for me, they're part of the same coin. Activism and philanthropy is kind of political action. Last question before we wrap up from uh, the audience. Uh, in, in your previous report, you, you included the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. You're now focusing more on uh, technology recommendations. Well, what's, uh, what's driving that change? Um, so the change is essentially driven by a reassessment, like we always do reassessments of our charities. And I think we've come to a different view on the effectiveness of the, of the carbon market around forests. So it's not that we don't like forests anymore. Sometimes, sometimes people like we don't like forests anymore. That's not true. Rather, we're much more pessimistic about the ability to uh, build up a carbon market that actually protects forests, which is kind of a major uh, advocacy proposition uh, of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. And so, like, we think this has a lot of problems. It's very intractable, whereas kind of the main route that we're focusing on right now, energy innovation, does not require, like, high levels of global coordination, etc. It's like, so in that sense, it seems like a much more robust uh, value proposition, but it's not the unpopular we don't like trees anymore. It's just, um, yeah, we've come to a different view on, on the feasibility of that or the relative impact of that. Great. Thank you very much. I think we're pretty much at the end of uh, our slot already. And uh, with that, I guess we'll hand back over and switch to the next presentation. Sure. You can also give to the EA fund, uh, sorry, to the for the Facebook Giving Tuesday, by the way, I should also say that. But yeah, thanks everyone.